Statistical tools are amazing at helping us understand the world around us. They let us understand the relationships between important economic indicators, rigorously test the efficacy of new medical interventions, and even let us know, once and for all, which cat video is considered the funniest. But on a more serious note, statistical tests, for all their sophistication, can be wrong. And they can be wrong in two very specific ways. Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and in this episode, we'll learn all about the two ways statistical tests can be wrong, what we call type 1 and type 2 error, or in much more reasonable language, false positives and false negatives. If you stick around, I'll provide an intuitive definition of both types of errors using rich examples to help make the idea stick. I'll discuss what might cause each type of error, and we'll end with a take on which type of error is worse. So let's jump in and start with a quick example to illustrate what these two types of error are. Let's consider a criminal trial. There are two main outcomes. A jury can find a defendant innocent, or they can find a defendant guilty. But it would be naive to think that juries get it right 100% of the time. There are plenty of cases of jurors making mistakes for a whole host of reasons. In other words, the actual innocence or guilt of a criminal, whether they really did commit the crime or not, is not necessarily the same thing as what a jury concludes. The jury instead is deciding, based on the evidence in front of them, what they think. But, like we said, they could be wrong. So let's map that idea out in a simple table. On the left here, I have the outcomes from the jury, and on the top, I have the truth. Now, we can't ever know the truth for sure, but in reality, the person on trial either did commit the crime or they didn't. That much is for sure, even if we or the jury can't know with certainty which it was. That leaves us with four possible situations. Two of them are what we call correct inferences. In this box is the case where the criminal really did commit the crime and the jury believed so as well. We call that a true positive. And in this box, the criminal really didn't commit the crime and the jury again believed so as well. We call that a true negative. However, there are still these two boxes here. These are our errors. This box here, where the person on trial really did commit the crime, but the jury concludes that they didn't, is what we call a false negative. They concluded that the person was innocent, but they were wrong. And in this box here, where the person on trial didn't commit the crime, but the jury concluded that they did, is what we call a false positive. They concluded the person was guilty, even when the person never committed a crime in the first place. Now, the good news is that we tend to think that jurors get it right most of the time. In other words, their error rates are hopefully pretty low, but critically, they aren't zero. Jurors are human beings, and human beings make mistakes. Specifically, they make these two types of mistakes. Okay, time for a quick aside. I call these errors false positives and false negatives, but some people prefer the terms type 1 and type 2 error. They mean the exact same thing. Except calling something a type 1 or a type 2 error is just unnecessarily opaque. You have to remember which one is which, and there's no clear logic as to why a false positive is a type 1 error and a false negative is a type 2 error. Using type 1 versus type 2 also somehow implies that type 1 is worse than type 2, which, if you stick around to the end of this video, I'll show you isn't quite true. So, going forward, I'm just going to call these false positives and false negatives, terms that I think are a lot more intuitive. Anyway, let's look at another example to make really clear what this is all about. And let's take humans out of this to simplify things even more. Specifically, let's consider a fire alarm. The job of a fire alarm is to alert people to the presence of a fire, but like our jury, it too can make mistakes. Let's again make the same type of 2x2 two two table to see what could go wrong. On the left, I now have what the fire alarm does. It either makes a crazy loud noise or it doesn't. And on the top, I have the reality of the situation. There is a fire or there isn't. And again, there are two places where all is right with the world. There could be a fire and the alarm goes nuts. And there could be no fire and the alarm stays silent. Those are both good outcomes. The errors, however, are in these two boxes. On the one hand, there could be a fire, but the alarm doesn't go off. That's a false negative. Or there could be no fire, and the alarm wakes you up in the middle of the night for no good reason. That's a false positive. We'll actually come back to this example in a bit to talk about which type of error is worse. But first, let's take a look at one more example, but firmly in the domain of statistics. But before we do that, if you could take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content I put out, I'd really appreciate it. With that said, let's look at false positives and false negatives, specifically in statistics. There are lots of statistical tests we could talk about, but let's focus on a simple one, one where we compare the average of two groups. 
To make this concrete, let's imagine we have two high schools with a thousand students each. And we want to know which high school has taller students on average. So we sample, say, 50 students from each high school at random, measure their heights, and then compare the average heights of each of those smaller groups. If one group comes back taller than the other, we might conclude that the corresponding high school, on average, has taller students. Technically speaking, we'd probably run what's called an independent sample t-test. But that's not really what's important here. Rather, I want to focus on the intuition of this situation instead of the statistical jargon. Anyway, we can again build our 2x2 two two box to see what that would look like. On the left, we have what our statistical test tells us based on those 50 students from each high school. There are really only two possibilities here. Either the averages are the same, or they're not. But crucially, we didn't measure all 1,000 students in each school, but rather just took a sample of 50 from each one. That means that just by dumb luck, the 50 students we happen to measure might not reflect the heights of the entire school. In other words, ignoring our sample and statistical test, the reality might be that for all 1,000 students in each high school, there is or isn't a difference in terms of average height. What's critical to understand here is that what is true in reality is never what we observe. We never measured the heights of all 1,000 students in each high school, but rather just measured the heights of 50 randomly selected students from each school. But reality doesn't care about who we measured. There is or there isn't a difference across the two schools, and that has nothing to do with our statistical test or sample. By the way, this is now firmly in the world of statistical significance testing, a topic I cover in much greater detail in a different video that I'll make sure to link to below. In any case, our statistical test instead is trying to say whether we think there is a difference across these schools based on the sample of students who we happen to have heights for. And like with the jurors and with smoke alarms, our statistical test can be wrong. First though, let's look at the good cases. Here is the case where, in reality, there is no difference in heights across classrooms, and our statistical test, based on that sample of 50 students from each school, agrees. And here is the case where, in reality, there is a difference, and our test agrees again. But these two boxes are where problems emerge. We might have a situation where a test says that there is a difference when, in reality, there is not. That's our false positive case. And we might have a situation where a test says that there isn't a difference when, in reality, there is. That's our false negative case. But where do these errors come from? For false positives, the error lies entirely in the sample we happen to pick. In a perfect world, the height of students in a random sample should exactly mirror the heights of all students in the whole school. But we don't live in a perfect world, and sometimes random samples are poor reflections of reality. For example, if our random sample, just by dumb luck, only included high school seniors for one of the schools, but was actually a pretty good reflection of all students in the other school, we might conclude that this school has taller students. But hopefully you see that in reality, that conclusion was based on the fact that the sample of students measured from the school are not a good reflection of the entire school. So false positives come from just dumb luck. For false negatives, it's a bit more complex. There are three main reasons why we might see a false negative. Small sample sizes, small differences across our populations, and high variability in the data. Of those, the biggest problem is that of small sample sizes. Imagine if instead of measuring the heights of 50 students per school, I only measured five per school. I'm pretty sure we can all see the intuition that drawing a conclusion based on just five students per school is ill-advised. There's certainly statistics behind that intuition, but again, that's not the point. The point is that if you don't have enough data in your sample, it makes it really hard to draw meaningful conclusions. So we now see that there are these two types of errors, false positives and false negatives. But which is worse? Some people have very strong opinions about this, but the reality is that the answer entirely depends on the context. Take the fire alarm example. What's worse, a fire alarm going off every now and again when there's no fire, or a fire alarm not going off when there really is a fire? To me, and I bet to most of you, the second option is far worse, which is why when calibrating a fire alarm, manufacturers err on the side of being oversensitive, maybe having a few false alarms, but by doing so, they minimize the risk that an alarm will stay silent when it's most needed. So in this case, a false negative is much worse. On the other hand, we can consider the case of a jury. What's worse, setting a criminal free or convicting an innocent person? There's certainly some subjectivity in that answer, but our criminal justice system does have the strong belief that people are innocent until proven guilty, suggesting that sending an innocent person to jail is worse than setting free a guilty person. In this case, then, a false positive is worse. 
In statistics and science more generally, it's less clear which is worse. We typically find ourselves wrestling between concluding that a new scientific discovery is true versus failing to learn something new about the world. A false positive means we claim something to be true when it isn't, and a false negative means we failed to learn something new that could be critical to our understanding of the world. On balance, which is worse? I don't have a good answer, but I'd love to hear from you. Take a moment to comment below. In statistics and science, which do you think is worse, a false positive or a false negative, and why? Overall, what I hope you learned here is that statistical results, or any test really, can be wrong in one of two very specific ways, a false positive and a false negative. I hope your intuition for these concepts has grown, and I hope you can apply that knowledge to something meaningful and real. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.